you have your Bibles with you, you can open to Genesis chapter 2. We are finishing out uh, Genesis chapter 2 this morning, beginning in verse 18. If you are using the uh, blue Bibles in the pew there, you will see that we are on page 3. Page 3 of the blue Bibles there. In the pew. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is God's holy word. So as we've been uh, studying and hearing through uh, Genesis chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, we all of a sudden come upon this dramatic change in the narration of the history of the heavens and the earth. We, we heard in chapter 1 of the glorious uh, creator God. Who, uh, who, who called all things into being by the word of his power, who created all things from nothing. And at the end of that first chapter, we're told in summary form how he created man. He created man, male and female, after the image of God. And last week we saw how uh, as, as we zoomed in on that creation of male and female, how the Lord God, the covenant-keeping Yahweh, how he intimately was involved in the creation of man, forming man from the dust of the earth and breathing into him life. And it was all very good. And so when we read here now in verse 18, this should, this should shock us. This should uh, cause us to take note. Because now, after five days of evening and morning creation, followed by a benediction, it is good. And it is very good. We see here, for the first time, God pronounces a malediction, a bad word, literally. It's not good for a man to be alone. And so this should cause us to take note. God is now calling something not good. And, and that should speak to us volumes. And what it speaks to us is that Remember, God deals with Adam as the representative head of all mankind. We, we knew that from the very beginning, for the very name Adam, in Hebrew it means man, and, and he's speaking to man, all of mankind. And, and Adam knew and was, was told that everything that he did affected everyone who would come after him. And this is understood much more fully in the Lord Jesus in the New Testament, 
when Paul explains to us that when Adam fell, we fell with him in his sinfulness. So God deals with Adam as a pattern for all of mankind. And when we wrap our heads around that, we realize that contrary to our nature, uh, our sinful nature now, that God says it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good that man dwell in loneliness, in isolation from one another. This is not a good thing. He began back in chapter 1 when, when the Lord uh, spoke into being all of the world and then he created man from the dust of the earth. He says, let us make man in our image. Communicating to us our entire understanding of relationship, our entire understanding of what it means to live in community, to live one with another, not in isolation, but in seeing that our God, even if we, we don't take that saying, uh, that, that phrase that let us make man in our own image, even if we don't take that to be a, a, a veiled reference to the Trinity, if we just take it to be the enormous immensity of God, that he lives in relationship one to another within the Godhead, that, that he, all relationship, all being one with another flows out of our understanding of who God is, that he is the, the essence of relationship. He is love. Our understanding of, of love at all, in any way, shape, or form, comes from him and the love that exists within the Godhead. You know, Augustine, I, I think I've said this to you before, he famously had a, a way of looking at the Trinity and understanding that the, the Trinity can be understood as the love and the lover and the love between them. That God is love and the lover is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit that is the love between them that overflows upon you and I. And understanding that, that everything that we do and say and purpose in our lives toward one another, it flows out of that understanding that God himself is love. He made us to need one another. The, the ultimate intimate relationship that he then develops here in this chapter between Adam and his wife Eve. It, it's the, the beginning, it's the foundation of our society, of our culture, of, of our very churches, but it out from that flows our understanding of all other relationships. From a husband and a wife, they have a relationship and they are a family before the Lord ever blesses them with children. And that love of their children flows out from the love between the husband and the wife. And our understanding of all other relationships, the relationships we have outside of our marriages, it's all predicated upon that one relationship within our family. The way we relate to others of, of the opposite gender, it all flows from our understanding of the, the soul relationship between husband and wife. The, the way that we relate to the rest of the community, it, it, it is based upon that 
commitment, that, that, that relationship that reflects the Lord himself. And we see that the Lord God, he took it upon himself to make this happen. We didn't uh, develop this of our own. Adam didn't come up with this idea of, hey, you know, it, it, it stinks being all by myself here. Let me go find somebody to, to, to call my own. But it, it was the Lord God himself who took it upon himself to make this happen. We see in verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. In verse 19, the Lord God formed. In verse 21, the Lord God caused. In verse 22, the Lord God made. The picture is here of, just as in chapter 1, all provision for life itself, all provision for relationship, comes from the will of the Father, from the Lord God himself. He so desires for you to be in relationship that he provides you everything that you need in that. He, he says, he forms, he causes, he makes to happen. Christ builds his church the same way. We see in 1 Peter 2 that Peter says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. It's a picture of Christ now in, in, in being uh, uh, just as his father uh, called all things into being and all things were made through Christ. Now Christ is building his church by building you and I together as living stones in his church with great care, with great precision. He places us with the people and the situations that he <laughs> desires for us to live in community in that situation with those people. It's the only way we understand all the one another's of the New Testament. There are so many one another's of the New Testament. Love one another, serve one another, encourage one another. All of those exhortations can only happen when we live in community with one another. That's, that's boots on the ground theology. That's real life. It's not just showing up on Sunday and saying, yeah, hey, brother, how you doing? No, it's, it's during the week. It's, it's living together and being knitted together and fashioned together as the Lord builds us as living stones being built into a spiritual house. In Christ, he restores us into his image, into the perfect image that he reflects of that, that relationship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, that perfect love, that sacrificial love, and he restores you and I into that. There is one body, and there is one Spirit, as you were called in one hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is through him and for him that we are called to this one hope. See, we must fight the pull of our own sinful nature, of our own sinful heart, and, and the, the pull of our, of our world, of this world that will pull us apart that would separate us, that would tell us, you know what, it's just easier for me to live life on my own terms. I just like animals better than people. That, that pull is there. That, that pull is there because of our sinful nature. And yet we must fight that and see that in this, we have been called to be in community with one another. 
the example of Christ. He came to serve and to give his life for you and for I, for others. He did not live to please himself, but lived to please the Father and to, to redeem a people to his own. Now, we are never commanded by Scripture to absent yourself from relationship. We're never called in Scripture to absent ourselves from marriage. It, it, that is actually seen as a feature of those who have departed from the faith. As Paul tells us uh, in, in Timothy, that devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Paul also points out that some in the church are given the gift of celibacy but only for the purpose of serving Christ and his body. Some are called to that in a special gifting by the, the, the Holy Spirit to serve one another. So their calling is no different than the rest of us who are called to live faithfully in marriage. It's to serve one another. It's the same calling, it just looks a little different. And that's what we are to see in this passage as well. The second point is that we are called in servant leadership to reflect the image of our God as the, the God who serves and who leads by serving. In verse 19 and 20, the Lord God in his care for man demonstrates to Adam that there is no suitable helper for him to be found. It says that the Lord God uh, brought them to the man that to see what he would call them. And in naming all of the animals, Adam is exercising what he has been commanded to do in chapter 1. It is dominion over all the creatures. So Adam is called upon to name all the animals. Now there's much that can be said about that, but what we uh, do see in this is that all those that he has dominion over they are not of his kind. And although he's doing what he is called to do, still there is not a suitable helper found for him. And so Adam becomes aware of his, of his need by the hand of God, by the one who uh, uh, leads him to understand this. Instead, the Lord shows us that one must be taken from his side to be fashioned perfectly for man. This is one of my favorite quotes from Matthew Henry, the, the great Puritan preacher. It was uh, spoken at uh, Farah and my wedding, and so it has always meant uh, so much to me. Matthew Henry says that we see from this scripture that that woman is not taken from, the, from his head to top him, nor out of Adam's foot to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected by him, and near his heart to be loved and beloved of Adam. What a great picture of why the Lord does all things so well. It's, it should speak volumes to us men who are called to live with our wives in an understanding way, in a sacrificial way. As we image the Lord himself and his intention for us. And when this occurs, Adam speaks the very first words 
of mankind in the garden, in his sinless state in the garden, Adam speaks that this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And we oftentimes hear so many distortions of this view that somehow this indicates Adam's superiority or that he is above, that, that he is higher than, or that he is greater than in some way or another. But actually this is indicating his position in the relationship, not his or her relative values, for it has already been declared that man is created male and female after the image of God. We must always remember within the church and cling to the fact that our God has created us with the equal value. We stand, as the saying goes, level at the foot of the cross. Where, as Paul says, there is no male or female, but one hope one faith, one people of God. And that is how we are to treat one another, how we are to love one another in that, in that reality. Paul appeals to this discussion when he discusses marriage in 1 Corinthians 11 and in Ephesians 5. He says, for man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So he is explaining the relationship amongst them, but not their value. He says they both share the image of God equally. And look at how the Lord God fills the need of the man that he created first. It says that the, the Lord creates for him a helper. That word there in Hebrew, it's an it's a easer. He creates an easer for, for man. And too often, we see that in a backwards way. Like as if, well, she's just a helper. That's her role. That's her function. That's her, her highest calling. But... That, that's a backwards way to look at it. It's, it's, it entails Adam's inadequacy that he should not be alone. It's, it's describing that Adam, I have created you all very good, but I have created you to need another. That in order for you to fulfill the mandate of dominion, and of reflecting my image, you need a helper, someone who can come alongside you. This word entails his inadequacy, not any supposed inferiority. And we know this because elsewhere in the Old Testament, that same word is used of God. God is our easer. He is our helper. It, it speaks of our inadequacy. I cannot live. I cannot survive. I cannot thrive and be who God created me to be without my helper, without the Lord God who is my helper. I need him in all things. And in this relationship, it's a complementary relationship. She supplies what Adam needs and what he lacks and vice versa. He supplies what she needs and what she lacks. 
her perfect suitability to do this is what leads to the explanation in verse 24. Therefore, because of this fact, because that she is his easer and he needs a helper, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. It speaks of the whole way that we as men should see our calling as husbands. For as Paul tells us in the New Testament, no one ever hates his own flesh, but loves and cares for it. What, what person would would harm his own self, his own being, without thought of what he is doing. And, and this, this scripture speaks to us of, remember that the Lord made you to reflect his image, his love, his care, his relationship. And so therefore, you must cherish, you must guard, you must protect this easer that has been given to you. Now Paul references this exact same scripture to communicate its ultimate meaning, as we read earlier in Ephesians 5. See, marriage, this relationship between Adam and Eve, it was designed to point us to the real mystery that it is Christ and his church. So often we, we just kind of skate over that because that is a mystery that is profound and difficult and calls us to a, a deeper level of love and sacrifice than we are typically prepared to to give to one another. When we consider our marriage, our partner, that intimacy is so close, so real, that you are no longer two, but one flesh. And we are called to image Christ and the way he loves his church in our relationship as husband and wife. One commentator says, we are never more like God than when we live faithfully in our covenant relationship as husband and wife. When I love you with an everlasting love, even when you irritate the stink out of me, and when you, you, you speak poorly of me, or you, uh, you are not loving me. I never better image the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for his church than when I respond to that lack of love with love and sacrifice. That is the real meaning of why we are given one to another. And finally, the, this uh, section of Scripture, it summarizes it all for us. Moses, you know, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing this history of the creation of the world and of mankind, and of the, the as we call it, the institution of marriage. He summarizes in verse 25, and he says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, little kids read this and they giggle. <laughs> they were naked and they weren't ashamed. But we should see in this the, the great uh, profound summary of the relationship. It, it certainly summarizes the relationship that Adam and Eve enjoyed together. But if we think to the next chapter, when they're... Adam and Eve fall into sin. They are not 
ashamed to be with one another any longer. But who is it that they hide from? In their shame, it's them hiding from the Lord God. Their shame causes them to turn away further from the Lord. They have already broken his commandment in disobedience, and their shame causes them to turn further inward, further away from the Lord. And Moses is explaining to us that just as our relationship with one another points to our relationship with to the Lord. So these verses point us to the one who takes away all that shame, who restores us to that image that we were created in the garden. See, remember, it was written by Moses as the people were about to enter the promised land, the land flowing of milk and honey, the land of promise that the Lord had provided for them, where they would live faithfully as his people. And he's reminding them who they were created to be. Now he, as he's writing these words, and the people as they're reading them, or being read to them for the first time, they clearly knew they were no longer like Adam and Eve. They were no longer sinless. So what is the meaning for them? It pointed them to the covenant-keeping God, Yahweh, their creator, their redeemer that brought them out of the land of Egypt, who provided a covering for their sin, that they were no longer ashamed to be called the people of God that they were called to live without shame before him, no longer slaves to Pharaoh, the shame of slavery, but a people of God's own possession, a covenant people, holy and set apart to live for, them, for, for God. And that's why it was written to, for us as well, to remind us how we are to live in relationship to Christ as our Redeemer and Savior, the one who covers our sin with his blood, that we would walk before him with no shame, for he has taken all of our shame upon himself. When he offered himself up a sacrifice on the cross, bearing our shame for our sinfulness. We are no longer sinless. We still deal with remaining sin in our hearts, but because God is the covenant-keeping God who has already provided the atonement for our sin, the covering of our sin, and has made the reconciliation between God and man that would soon be revealed in the very next chapter. In chapter 3, we can walk without shame because Christ has covered me. You cannot say anything about me that has not been said about my Jesus. And so there is no shame for the believer. And that, that by the power of the Spirit, we can now live in covenant faithfulness with God because Christ is our covenant keeper. He has kept that covenant of marriage that you and I are called to. Just as the triune God created us to be, to walk in, in, in faithful relationship with him, not because of us, just like it was not because of Adam, but because God is a faithful, covenant-keeping God.
and he has provided the faithfulness for you in Christ.